never really panicked until I saw the fire trucks that were waiting for us on the ground. I remember thinking, if it's my time, it's my time. That was God's plan. What you just saw was an airplane, a jet, landing at the Nashville International Airport on the 7th of November, 1992. Aboard that plane was a survivor, and she is our guest on this show. Ladies and gentlemen, Reba McIntyre. Welcome to our show. Thank you very much. I w I'd like to address what they've just seen on the screen, first okay. of all. What, what happened? Why did you have a pancake landing here in Nashville? When we left the Gallatin Airport, we couldn't get our landing gear up or down. It was jammed. And so we went to the International Airport to try to figure out why. And as we flew by the tower, they told us, yes, your landing gear is not where it's supposed to be. So we flew around Nashville to burn off fuel and to go make another run by the or flight by the tower to see again, because Kevin McCutcheon, my pilot, was working the controls, trying to get the landing gear either up or down. And so as the third time or second time we th flew by the tower, they said, um, still not up, still not down. Was this the nose wheel? Uh-huh. Yeah, it was the landing gear on the front. Was this because a crewman had inadvertently left a flashlight in the housing? Uh-huh, and then when the landing gear tried to come up, it jammed up against the flashlight. How'd you feel? Well, immediately when I heard the landing gear not go up, I knew something was wrong, and I looked over at Narvel, who was sitting right beside me, and I said, something's not right. And sure enough, Kevin went like this to Narvel, said, come up here to the cockpit. And he told him what was wrong, and he came back, and he said, okay, we're gonna have to fly over and do all these precautionary measures, take these precautionary measures to see what's wrong. and. So when, when we were flying around, you know, Sandy speak of my, hair, my hairdresser and my clothing designer was in with Narvel and myself. And we thought, well, we're just going to fly over there and see what's going on. Didn't think a thing about it. Knew the possibilities, but didn't want to think about it. And so we started talking about, oh, places we were going to eat in Albuquerque when we flew in there the next weekend, making small talk. Sandy and I were playing cards. And so when we did make our first touchdown, to see what was going on. That's when we saw the fire trucks. And that's when it really hit me. This is serious. They're not playing around here. And so that's when my eyes started watering up. I thought, wow, this is serious. And we went back up and flew around some more to burn off more fuel because we were full. And so when Kevin came over the speaker again, he said, okay, we're going to touch down on the rear wheels and then we're gonna slow down as much as possible and then the nose of the plane is gonna come down and it's gonna be metal against concrete. So it's gonna be a little noisy and there's gonna be a few sparks. Now when the plane comes to a complete stop, we're gonna turn off the power, turn off the lights and then you unbuckle your seatbelt. Now can't you imagine what's going through your mind about this time? <laughs> well, um, you'll unbuckle your seatbelt and slowly walk to the front of the plane and disembark. Narva looks over at me and says, if he thinks I'm going to sit here until this plane stops, he's crazy. So once the, the lights were out, and when Kevin came from his seat to the front of the plane, there was Sandy and myself and Narva sandwiched together, ready to get off the plane. Remember Reba has a new book. It's called Reba my story and was written with tom carter who also wrote my books absolutely both yours and uh this is what it looks like it has a gorgeous picture of reba on the cover and i've read the book and i love it thanks it, it helped me to get to know you a lot better than i did and uh, i thought let's let's go for a funny story and then we'll go in another direction but there's a wonderful story about your first fanfare Fanfare is a gathering of country music fans from all over the United States 
and, and from the world. and from foreign countries mm -hmm. who come each June to uh, meet their favorite stars. But you hadn't had a lot of success at this point, had you? Zilch, absolutely none. I was with Polygram Mercury for eight years, eight albums, and had two number one records. And things were really, really slow, and I'm so thrilled and so thankful to Polygram Mercury for keeping me on the label as long as they did because they taught me an awful lot, and I learned a lot. Had great teachers. And when I went to Fanfare the first year, it was no recognition, no attention. Uh, the second year was no attention. So mother went down with me every year to Fanfare. And one year I was sitting there at the booth, and at the Polygram Mercury booth, and I had my little Sharpie pen, and I was in my little cubicle, and there was a, a, a cardboard sign above me, about three feet up above me, and it said, Reba McIntyre. So I was sitting there, and I was supposed to sit there for two hours, and I'd look around, and everybody watching would go by, and they look at my name and look at me and walk on by. And, <laughs> and so here come this couple, this man and woman, and they looked at me, looked at the name, looked at me again, and they talked a little bit, and they walked up to me, and I got my pen ready. I thought, I'm going to give an autograph. And the man walked up to me and said, can you tell me where the bathroom is? <laughs> <laughs> Not only did I about cry, but my mama did too. It just broke her heart. Her little girl had to sit there. When you were a little girl, did you want to grow up and be a nurse or, or something other than what you became? Uh -uh. I wanted to be a cowgirl. Oh, I wanted okay. to be a world champion barrel racer. Because we were at the rodeos, and the women were competing in the barrel racing, and their daddy was. Daddy was, to me, I mean, what other kids thought were heroes, you know, Roy Rogers, the cowboy, my daddy was the, was the hero. He was the world champion, steer roper, and all of us kids, when it came daddy's time to rope, you know, nowadays kids go out behind the chutes and play and rope, never watch their parents compete. But when it came Clark McIntyre, when he was announced over the loudspeaker, we all hustled up the grandstands and sat right by Mama, and we didn't sit by anybody who was eating peanuts. That was a no-no. That's bad luck. That's the only superstition really? I know Mama ever had. You mean uh, among rodeo people, that's considered bad luck? Uh-huh. You don't sit by anybody eating peanuts. And she would move all four of us kids. <laughs> We'd go find other seats. It's not like we had, you know, assigned seats anyway. We sat wherever we could find a seat. And uh, we'd watch Daddy rope every time. And your father was a world champion, wasn't Three he? Three years. 57, 58, and 61. Steer roping. Mm -hmm. When you were a little girl, did your mother teach you to cook or sew? What are mountain oysters? Uh, <laughs> we don't have to say this. They all know what they are. Uh, now see, when you go down to the pens, uh, we would uh, give them shots of different things and ear tag them and dehorn them and brand them. So you kind of work from one end to the other. <laughs> and then... Uh, uh. The last thing would be was to uh, change their lifestyle. And <laughs> Susie would usually hold the tail, and, uh, uh, or before Susie did, I had to, and I would hand Daddy all the, uh, the vaccinating needles and... Then as I got older, I, I could load them myself, fill them up with medicine, and then I eventually got to where I gave the shots myself. But during that period of time, uh, one of us kids, one of us little girls would hold the tail, and Daddy would cut the sack, pull the testicles down, and cut them, and hand them to us, and then we'd put them in a bucket. Then us three girls would take the buckets to the house. We'd probably do 100, 200 bulls a day. That's a bunch of mountain oysters. Yes. <laughs> And so we'd, us girls They would, taste like uh, chicken? Kind of like fish. Kind of like fish. We'd take them to the house and, and sit out by the back porch and clean them and then take them into mom and she'd fry them. We'd eat them that day. When you were about, and you, you can correct me, a seven, you came to the Grand Ole Opry for the first time, didn't you? I think it was when I was seven, yeah. Why did you come? Well, that's the only vacation we ever took was to Nashville because all of the other times we were rodeoing and, and you could kind of consider it a vacation. We traveled up in the Northwest and uh, Oklahoma and Texas and Wyoming, Colorado, and Montana. And when we'd go rodeoing, in between rodeos, we'd go sightseeing, mm -hmm. whether it's through Yellowstone Park or Cody, Wyoming, through the museum, or through the mountains. But our basic non-working vacation was only to Nashville. And we all wanted to go see the Grand Ole Opry. Because us kids, we were singing quite a bit when we were younger, and all in the high school, in the first grade Christmas program, I sang away in the manger in second grade. Third, Peyton and Susie did the same thing. Alice didn't sing much. 
So we were going down to Nashville, and we made several trips, but the one I remember the best, we all got sick. It was Aunt Jenny and Uncle Slim, and Mom and Daddy and us four kids, and we got real sick going down, or a few of us did, and by the time the Grand Ole Opry started that Friday night, I got sick at the show. And see, when you, it was at the Ryman Auditorium, not, not here at Opera Land, and when you walk, when you, back in those days, if you got underneath the balcony, anybody who was sitting in the balcony, if they had a Coke and they spilled it, well, it would leak through the cracks and it would hit you underneath. Well, of course, nobody ever wanted to sit under the balcony. And the best seats were down close to the stage. And so we always got the cheapest uh, admission price, and so that was underneath the balcony. So what we'd do is we'd wait until somebody down front would get up and go to the bathroom or leave, and then we'd sneak down and get a good seat. Well, Mama went first. I think Daddy and Alice was already scattered everywhere, and, and Mama went down. She found a good seat, and I was sitting kind of underneath the bleachers, getting feeling awful, and I was getting hit on the head with Coke and stuff and all kind of soft drinks, and, and I got to feeling worse, and I walked down and found Mama. I said, Mama, I think I'm going to be sick. I think I'm going to throw up. She said, go find a bathroom. <laughs> and she never took her eyes off the stage. That's how big fans we were of the Grand Ole Opry, and still are. And so I went trying to find a bathroom, and I found an usher, and I asked him. Well, I was feeling so bad, I couldn't comprehend what he, where he wanted me to go. So I found the front door. And I walked out the front steps, and <clears throat> there it happened. I threw up on the front steps of the Ryman Auditorium. <laughs> and I was wearing a pink dress that Sally Williams, my cousin, had given me in a giveaway sack. And uh, a gentleman walked up to me and handed me a handkerchief. He said, here, little girl. And I wiped my mouth off, and I didn't know any better. I handed it back to him. He said, <laughs> he said, oh, that's all right. You can keep it. <laughs> I didn't know any better. I was just going to give it back as his. I'd like to play a videotape for you. This is you singing, and the occasion is very special. OK. Oh, say, can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we held at the twilight's last ring through broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight for the ramparts we watched were so little bassy, aren't I? <laughs> the reason I bring up 1974 is because this played a key role in what you were about to do. And you were about to become one of those people chasing a dream in show business. What happened? Well, to start it all off, I was a sophomore at Southeastern State University in Durant, Oklahoma. And I was getting ready to, I think it was for the summer, and Daddy had mentioned to me, are you going to the finals this year? I said, in December? He said, yeah. I said, well, yeah. He said, well, won't you do something uh, other than just go up and have a good time? So I sat there for a little bit. Now, Daddy knew I really just wanted to go up to the finals and just have fun. But I knew better to say that. And so I was going to be very grown up and say, well, Daddy, what do you think I should do? He said, well, won't you get a job? Kind of pay for your expenses while you're up there. And I said, well, doing what? He said, uh, singing the national anthem. Oh, wow, that's a great idea. So we called Clem McSpadden, who was one of the NFR wheel horses, one of the main people. And we had known Clem for years because Clem had, had, had been a rodeo announcer when Daddy was rodeoing and, and is still today a rodeo announcer. And um, I called him up and said, I think I could sing the national anthem during the finals. He said, let me check it out. So sure enough, he got me the job. And so I was singing for the nine performances in 1974. Nowadays, they're 10. And during the week, like on a Wednesday night, I was coming back from the bathroom, clearing my throat, getting ready, and walking up to the bandstand to sing with Al Good and his orchestra. And Ken Lance, who had let me and Peyton Susie sing at his Ken Lance Sports Arena in Ada, Oklahoma for many years, uh, stopped me. And he said, hey, Reba, won't you meet a friend of mine? And I looked up this big old red-headed feller named Red Stegall. And I shook his hand, I said, well, y'all, Good to see you. I got to get on up there. I got to sing. And so I walked on up and sang. And that night after the rodeo, Mama and Daddy and Pake and myself all went over to the Hilton because uh, the Justin 
boot people were have they had a suite up there and that's where all everybody congregated after the rodeo and a lot of the cowboys would sing and have a big time and visit and so we went up there and uh, red was there too what did you sing that night well uh, i think one of the cowboys i think it was everett shaw asked me to sing uh joshua because that was the song i always sang at the uh, high school auditorium with the Kiowa high school cowboy band so I sang Joshua. Red didn't know the chords, and I couldn't play the guitar well enough to even do it myself, so I kind of sang it a cappella. Could you do that for us now? You know it's a Dolly Parton song. Yes. And I'm a huge fan of I remember of the song. Joshua, Joshua, what you doing living here all alone? Joshua, Joshua, ain't you got nobody to call your own? <laughs> <laughs> Now, staying with, staying with, uh, with Red Steagall, Red uh -huh. Steagall, I believe, was asked by your mother for a favor. Yeah, well, uh, Bobby, uh, Red's first wife, and mother got to talking, and Bobby asked Mama, said, do you think there's, do the kids, or does Reba in particular, does Reba have any aspirations of getting in the music business one day? And Mama said, oh, definitely, all three of the kids are very serious about their music. And so Mama had asked Red, was there any way of getting the three kids into the music business in Nashville. And Red told her honestly, he said, no, Jackie, I'm, I'm just fighting for myself right now. I don't think I could do any good for you. And so Mama said, thanks. And we went out, out of Oklahoma City knowing we'd met a real nice person, Red Steagall, and knew we had a friend for life. And so in January, I went back to college at Durant, and Mama got a call from Red. And he said, Jackie, I've been thinking about it, and I can't take all three of the kids, but maybe I could try to get Reba started. And so Mom and I went down and we cut a demonstration tape. One song I had written and three or four that Red had co-written or written. And uh, he said, go home. Don't call us, we'll call you. And I went back to college and sort of forgot it. You know, if it happened, it happened. If it didn't, it wasn't supposed to be. And then he called us back and we went down that summer in 75. And uh, he said, I think we got a bite. But boy, it took a long time to get that bite. He took it all over town. Nobody wanted another girl singer. And so finally he was pitching the song that I had sung, not me, uh, and he pitched it to Glenn Keener, who was at Polygram Mercury. And Glenn liked my singing. And so they sent you a contract. Well, it didn't happen that quick. Uh, Glenn had to take uh, some tapes up to Chicago, where Polygram Mercury's headquarters was at the time. And they said, okay, Glenn, you can sign one female singer. And so he had one tape in his right hand, one tape in his left hand. And he said, uh, he looked down at him and he handed him my tape. And I've asked him since then, I said, who was the other tape? Who was the other girl? He said, I don't know, I don't remember. I want to ease over back to your personal life. Oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> Charlie Battles. Uh huh. He was your first husband. Uh huh. And uh, in reading the book and looking at the pictures, I got the impression that he was a great deal like your daddy. Charlie was built like daddy. He looked a lot like daddy with the dark hair and the build. He was a rancher, a rodeo champion. Um, Charlie was ten, is 10 years, 18 days older than myself. And so it was a lot of a father figure. Charlie was very, uh, very funny. Um, very, he was a, a practical joker. I mean, he, he, he was very funny. When we first started dating, we had a lot of fun. In our early years of rodeo, and we had a lot of fun rodeo together. And um, I guess it, the, the longer we were married, the more serious it got and less fun. What do you mean the more serious it got? Well, he started kind of helping me out with the music business and made a few bad decisions, which made me look bad, which I don't <laughs> like that. Of course, nobody does. And... Uh, it just didn't become as much fun. I think I was growing up, I was maturing, and I wasn't Charlie's little girl anymore. I'd like to establish the fact that Charlie Battles was a leading performer on the rodeo circuit. Mm -hmm. So I guess you knew him by reputation before you knew him. True. I knew him because I was rodeoing or going with Alice when she was rodeoing. Alice was the runner up to the world championship in 1971 for the barrel racing. So when I'd go with her, she was in the IRA, which is the International Rodeo Association, and so was Charlie. He was the world champion three years, 70, 71, 72 of the IRA. 
So consequently, when I'd go to rodeo with Alice, I would see Charlie. So I thought Alice and Charlie should get together because I thought he was really, really good looking. And, and Alice said, oh, Lord, Reba, he's married and got two kids. And I said, well, that's how. And then later on, Charlie and Pake were rodeoing together. And then me and my uh, roommate at college, Beth Crump, now married to Tom Walker, me and her would go rodeoing together and consequently be at the same rodeo. Well, of course, I was riding Pake's careful open horse, so me and Pake would be together a lot. And there was Charlie. Did you break up his marriage? I think it was a marriage looking for a place to break up. Honestly, I do. And um, Pake told me after, after Fort Smith, after the rodeo, we were out the roping pen one day. He said, did you know Charlie and his wife broke up? I had no idea. Were you at that point interested in Charlie? I thought he was good looking. But, you know, he was a married man. What happened to that marriage? I started having a mind of my own, and I wanted things different. And he didn't want to change. He wanted me to slow down in the music business. After I won the Entertainer of the Year in 86, I remember being out on the back porch, and he said, well, you did it. And we were just so thrilled. We were just so happy. And he said, are you ready to slow down? And I said, no, I'm ready to kick it into high gear. He said, oh, surely not. Uh, you, do you think that at that crossroads in your life, uh, that marriage was doomed? I think I chose career over marriage. I really do. About 1980, you hired a new steel guitar player, didn't you? Uh-huh. I didn't. Pike did. A guy named Narville Blackstock. Yeah. And he was, uh, he was very much in your life for a long time before you even got interested in him. Oh, yeah. Narville and I, uh, Narville was my steel guitar player, my band leader, my road manager, my tour manager, then my manager. Then he got demoted and I married him. <laughs> <laughs> I think I always admired him, but, you know, it was really funny. Narville and I never hugged, never touched. Now, I'd hug Preacher's Neck and Wayne Lewis and... David Anthony and all my, you know, all the band members, and Larry Jones, my bus driver. We were, we were just like brothers and sisters. But Narville, just, you know, he didn't hug my neck, I didn't hug his neck. The only time we did was after I won Entertainer of the Year in 86, uh, I hugged his neck. Because I felt like he was just as much a part of the winning as I was, as I hugged everybody else in, in my band. You uh, married him after becoming involved with him for how long? Oh, let's see. I got my divorce in 87. He helped me through a lot of that. He, he was went your comfort? To, well, he went to the depositions with me. He went to the hearings with me. He was a lot of, uh, he was my support. He was a lot of comfort. And we had just admired each other for years. We respected each other. We wanted the same things. Um, I just admired him. You know my favorite story. No. I want you one? to retell it. Which one? The, with Tom T. Hall. We were playing an outdoor fair, and it was hot. My bus was an old bus. I, it, we'd probably been redone, remade, re-engined, everything, probably 60 times. And Tom T. had just gotten him a brand new bus. And, oh, it was beautiful. It was light blue and just painted so pretty. And, and our, we had an air conditioner on our bus, but it just didn't work that year. And it was real hot outside, and I was in my bus trying to put my makeup on, and it was kind of melting down on my neck and on my shirt. And so after I got as much on as I could keep on my face, we all went over on Tom T's bus and was visiting. We wanted to see his new bus, and he was real proud of it. And he was really nice to all of us greenhorns, us kids. And we got on the bus and was talking. And so I said, well, I got to go get ready. It's time for my show. And so I got on, on the stage, and, and it was a concrete slab with kind of a tin top. And, Oh, the sound was terrible. It was just awful. And the sound company couldn't get the monitors from, to stop feeding back. And, and I'd just grin and, and keep going through it. And it was just about to kill me. My ears were just, oh, you know how that feedback just mm -hmm. cuts right through you. And so I did my little 30-minute set. And we got off the stage. And, and um, I went back to my bus. And I was signing autographs out by the fence. And Tom went on. And after his show, they, I heard some commotion going on stage when he was on stage. 
And so after his show, well, as fast as we could, we got back on Tom's bus where the air conditioning was. And Tom sat down there, he said, was the sound bad when you were on stage? I said, oh, Lord, it was terrible. He said, well, why didn't you do something about it? I said, well, what did you expect me to do? I'm just the opening act. I have no power. He said, well, let me tell you something. Next time you get up there and it's bad, you do something about it. And I said, well, Tom, that's something that I'm really looking forward to. He said, what's that? I said, when I get rich and famous, all I'm going to do is bitch and sing. <laughs> <laughs> he told you that too yeah, one night on your show. Told. That's his favorite story too. Oh, he's a character. I want to ask you about probably the most painful thing that ever happened to you. And that's the plane crash in San Diego. We were doing four shows that week that were that would require leasing planes. I don't even think we could have made it commercially. And we flew into San Diego. Narvel and I and Sandy were on a hawker. And then the band and the part of the crew that we needed, they split up and went on two Sabre liners into San Diego. Well, they were there and ready for the show by the time Norval and Sandy and I got there. And so uh, we went to the, uh, to the hotel where the show was going to be held. And we, I got ready, did the show, and I did Sweet Dreams that night as my encore. The band left the stage and I did Sweet Dreams. And so we went back to the hotel, and uh, Jim Hammond, my tour manager, came up to the suites with us, with me and Narvel. And we were talking about, I wanted to show Jim the suite, because it was a really nice room um, they, that I, IBM had, had rented us for us that night. And it had a huge, swanky bathroom and real nice living room. And I was showing Jim around, because, man, we were just like, you know, kids from home. We were tickled to death about this. And so then, Narvel, we were coming back the next week, back to San Diego, and Narvel said, why don't we have everybody up here on, in the suite after the show next week, and we'll have hors d'oeuvres and, and some drinks, and we'll just have a, a get-together. And Jim said, I'll have it arranged. And so I hugged Jim's neck, and he went on down and loaded up everybody in the vans, and they went to the airport. So we went to bed, and Narvel was watching television still. He's a CNN fanatic. and um, I was asleep, and the phone rang. And it was uh, our pilot, uh, Roger, uh, Roger Woolsey. And um, he said, Narvel, can you come up here to my room? I think something terrible has happened. Well, what had happened was Wayne, Roger's brother, who was our co-pilot, went on one of the planes. Jim had talked to Narvel about, uh, Jim Hammond, had talked to Narvel about taking the Hawker that we had flown in on because it was a bigger plane than the Sabre Liner that we had usually been flying on. He said, can we swap you planes and that we will have more room? And Narvel said, sure. And it's just Sandy and Reba and myself, we won't need that much room. So we took, we were going to take the Sabre Liner back that next day. And so Roger was going to fly us. And so Roger went out with everybody to the other field. Um, I'll have to back up one more time. Once Jim got us at the airport, when we first flew in, he told us that there is a curfew where we flew in. And the band wouldn't be able to make it back to the airport to fly out before the curfew. The airport would be closed down. So Narvel said, well, instead of having to rush the show and rush everybody getting back over here, let's uh, have the pilots move the planes up to the other airfield that does not have a curfew. And so they did that, and so um, our pilot, Roger went out with everybody else to the other airport, and they got on their planes, and Roger was leaving the airport, and for some reason he looked in his rearview mirror and saw a huge ball of fire, an explosion. Uh, one plane took off safely, and one took off and hit the side of the mountain. I want to point out something here and commend Narvel. Narvel had the tough job of talking to the families. Mm -hmm. And that probably uh, was one of the hardest jobs he's ever had in his entire life. Without a doubt. But it kept him from breaking down. I, w I already had. I was going from room to room. We had, we had two rooms and a living room in the middle. Norval and I were sleeping in here, and this bedroom was vacant. And uh, he had to go in the other room to make phone calls because I was following behind him crying. And he finally had to tell me, he said, Reba, you're going to have to leave me alone. I can't do this with you crying. And so he called everybody, 
He called his mom and dad, but he forgot to call his children in Wyoming. And uh, I called my parents, and uh, I also called Barbara Mandrell because Barbara, uh, Kirk Capello had worked for her before he came to work for me, and I thought she should know. Reba, why did you write this book? To set the record straight on a lot of things that um, had been written about me, there are two other unauthorized biographies on me, and I, I flipped through them. The pictures were okay. I've seen them before, and um, basically they're newspaper articles and things I've gotten from the press. And I thought it was only fair to my fans, who are the reason I'm doing what I'm doing and the reason I have groceries on the table. I did it for them. And I also did it for Shelby. Um, this, is, this is kind of an introduction to his great-great-great-grandfather and his great-great-grandpap. And it uh, kind of tells him what I've been doing all my life. All right, that having been said, to set the record straight, let's go back to two points on which you received criticism. Okay. One was you sang at the uh, Academy Awards, what, nine days later? And the other was that you were in the uh, next edition of People magazine. Mm -hmm. And I think some people felt that uh, you didn't stay in mourning long enough. Uh, and I wanted you to address those things for me. Ralph, I really don't think mourning is healthy. Mourning, it, to me, I've been through it. If I hadn't been through it, I couldn't say that. But to keep busy was my only way of keeping my sanity. And I knew I had an organization to think of, too. They had families to feed. Their, their way of making a living and feeding their family was to be on the road. And if I didn't sing and perform, they didn't have a job. They'd have to go find a job with somebody else, and that takes time. And they weren't any, in any, they weren't in any shape to go looking for another job. We were a wreck. We were emotionally wrecked. How did you find the strength to sing at the, at the Oscar Awards? Well, when we got home Saturday night from San Diego, we went and visited the families, and the next day we did. But before we left for the next day on Sunday, I was at my dressing room table, my vanity, putting on my makeup, getting ready to go see the families. And, and I thought to myself, man, we got to tell the people at the Oscars. Because we discussed when we were going to go back on, on the road, and I said, maybe July. This was March. Mm -hmm. And so then I was thinking, man, the Oscars, I told them I'd sing. And I told them I'd sing, I'm checking out. That's the song they picked from the song from the Postcards from the Edge. And I started, through my, in my mind, going over the words of that song. And I thought, man, that's, that's, that's my band. They're checking out of this old Heartbreak Hotel, which is the earth. They've gone on to a better place. They're happy. And I had a very peaceful, very, just like no problems, no worry, no sorrow. And it was just like they said to me, go sing that for us. And I walked into the sitting room. Narvel was watching television. I said, Narvel, I'm going to do the Oscars. He said, what? I said, yeah, I'm, I'm supposed to. I know I am. And he called them the next day. Uh, called Sandy Brokaw, my publicist out on the West Coast, and Sandy called the people at the Oscars, and he said, uh, they never took your name off the list. Your faith in God gave you a great deal of strength, didn't it? I couldn't have done it without him. How about the People Magazine article? Uh, we picked the People Magazine article because Jane Sanderson is a very good friend of mine. I love her to pieces, and I know she respects my privacy. She respects uh, my feelings, and I knew that she would would do the best and say what I said in the, the, to the best of her ability. Write an article with some class to it. Mm -hmm. She's very, very good. You are a movie star now. No, I'm a movie twinkle. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we have, I, I think you're pretty good. I saw Tremors, I enjoyed that. Did you really? Yeah, Thanks. I did. At a time in your life when you felt very troubled, didn't you get a call from Kenny Rogers? Uh-huh. What did he say? Yeah, well, it really, it was, what happened was I was home, and uh, it was the summer of the same year of the plane crash, and Narvel came in, and, and we had talked about 
keeping busy, staying busy, and we had the month of May and June, b b basically that was when we took our vacations. Well, nobody wanted to take a vacation, we want to stay busy, and I said, Narvel, I need a change of pace. I mean, I can't get up every night and sing and turn around and they're not there. It still hurts too bad. And he said, you're not gonna believe this. He said, Ken Cragen, who is Kenny Rogers' manager, called him today and said, Kenny's gonna do another gambler movie and wants you to be the leading lady. And once again, the Lord took care of it. Let's uh, take a look at the monitor now. Oh boy. <laughs> Pistol packing So monitor. now I have to earn my way to San Francisco? You never said one word about contenders. Oh, get a grip, Hawks. When's the last time you saw five women agree on something? Never. Because it's never happened and it's not going to happen here. So we're going to have a little playoff. Each woman brought $20,000 in her player. The last one at the table takes the money to San Francisco and represents our little group. Why didn't you tell me about this before? Because you wouldn't have come. <laughs> Thank you. What's that line, get a grip, Hoss? Get a grip. <laughs> you know, what's so funny, that scene was shot right before lunch, the day before we had been at Fanfare. I had signed, we, we did our show at 3 o'clock down at the Municipal Auditorium for all of our fans and our fan club, signed autographs from 6, and I got on the plane at 2.30 in the morning, flew straight to L.A., got off the plane, my truck that I had leased at the time, the battery was down. We had to catch a ride over to the set, change clothes, Sandy did my hair, and we went straight on to this scene. And they did everybody's close-up first. And I had a lot of dialogue, you know, as you saw. And I was just about fried by that time. You know, about, you know sleeping on a plane is mm -hmm. not the best sleep in the world. But uh, I had done my part over and over for Kenny and Rick Rasevich to have their close-ups, and it was my turn. And Dick Lowry, the director, said, Okay, let's break for lunch, and then Reba can do her close-up after. I said, Dick, wait a minute. Please let me do my close-up now, because if I ever walk off this set, I don't know if I can walk back on. He said, okay, we're going to take a little postponement here. Reba's going to do her close-up now, and, and he let me do it. And he said it was the best scene I did on the whole movie. <laughs> I said, do I have to be totally fried before I do a good, good scene? Hey, there's a story. There's so much I would love to discuss with you from this book. But there's a story I think that really should be told. Beyond, just beyond that wall, we are at the Grand Ole Opry House. We're in a studio in the back of the Opry House. And just beyond that wall is the guard shack that keeps people out or lets people in. And the first time you ever came to sing on the Grand Ole Opry as a full-fledged performer, star, you had a problem at that little shack, didn't you? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What happened? Daddy and Mama and Alice had driven 700 miles from Chockey, Oklahoma, to see me perform my first time on the Grand Ole Opry. So we left the hotel, got all dressed up. Daddy had on a suit and tie. Mom was all dressed up. Alice was too. And we pulled in to the guard shack right back, back here. And Daddy said, roll down the window. He said, got Reba McIntyre here. She's going to sing on the Grand Ole Opry tonight. <laughs> we just as happy as we could be. And the guards flipped through his. He, he, good care less. And so he was flipping through the pages. He said, not tonight. <laughs> and Daddy said, well, what do you mean? She said, she's not on this list. She can't get in. They said, what do you think we ought to do? He said, well, I suggest you turn around and go home. He said, well, feller, we can't do that. We drove all the way from Oklahoma. So Daddy turned around. We went across the interstate, that get and go across the interstate. And I went in and used the telephone, pay phone, and called uh, Dick Blake of Lavender and Blake, uh, my booking agent at the time. And they got, that was my first job from them. Grand Ole Opry. So he said, I'm terribly sorry, there's been a misunderstanding. You go right back over there and they'll let you in. And sure enough, once we drove up, that guard was just grinning and drive right on up here, Mr. McIntyre. We'll get you right in here. Here's your parking place. And we went in and uh, we were just so proud to be here. I'm telling you, we were three proud Okies. And we got backstage and Daddy told me, we were standing back there waiting for him to tell me when I could go on. And Daddy said, Reba, do you realize that 30 years ago today, I won the all-around at the Pendleton Roundup Rodeo, September the 17th, 1947. And that was a, a major milestone in his life. Huge milestone. And there I was, my first time at the Grand Ole Opry. Near the end of the book, Reba, My Story, are some wonderful anecdotes about 
a man named Shelby. I say a man, he's four years old. Oh, he thinks he's a man, you bet. And I wanted you to tell those stories to our audience here. Shelby's so funny, there's so many Shelby stories. He's a, he's a great kid, he's a lot of fun, he's very energetic, and it's a chore to uh, insist upon him being a normal child, because uh, it's hard. I mean, the lifestyle we lead, it's, uh, it's, it's rough on him. But he, he is a good kid. He, he, uh, he helps out at the house. He has his little chores, and he loves to go walk, as he says. Uh, any favorite story you want me to Well, talk I like about? the one about uh, explaining to him about his dogs passing oh, away. Uh, Red Steagall gave him his first puppy. Uh, we named him Chalky after where I grew up. And uh, Chalky got ran over. He was, I think he had a girlfriend across the street. Anyway, he got hit by a truck. And so for his second birthday, Narvel and I gave Shelby a little Cocker Spaniel. We named him Freckles because he had little freckles on his nose. And Freckles got to Roman a little bit too, and he got hit by a car also. So one day we were all going out for supper. It was uh, Narvel and myself and Shelby, and Narvel's two youngest child children by his first marriage, Chastity and Brandon. And Brandon and Shelby were already in the back seat. Shelby's getting up in his car seat. And I thought I'd impress Brandon with Shelby's very high intelligence, as a mother would think. And so usually when Shelby, when I take him into bed, we'll say our prayers and I'll say, Shelby, uh, we'll say, God bless Mom and Daddy and Shelby and all the horses and the frames on the TV or wherever and the <laughs> curtains and the pillows and the stuffed animals. And finally, he kind of wears out and we go to sleep. And thank you, Jesus, you live in our hearts. So I said, uh, Shelby, tell Brandon where old Chalky is. He took his blanket out of his mouth and said, Chalky going to Jesus. And I said, well, now tell him where Freckles is. He takes his blanket out of his mouth and he says, Freckles going to Jesus. I said, now where does uh, Jesus live? Thinking, you know, it's really going to tie it in there. He took his blanket out of his mouth, looked at me and said, Florida? <laughs> Uh, one more, the uh, good boy story. Oh, yeah. We, were, we took a vacation two years ago, September, to uh, a motorcycle bus tour. Had a real good time, and we were staying at this beautiful uh, hotel at the homestead. And uh, Narvel and I were getting ready for supper. Always see, always food. It's always food. <laughs> and we were in the bathroom getting ready, and I was putting on makeup, and Narvel was doing his hair and whatever. And, and um, Shelby... We were trying to break him, you know, potty train him at the time. He still has his faithful blanket carrying it all over, all the house, over the house. And, and whenever he come to me and would say, pee pee, mama, pee pee, well, I'd say, let's go to the bathroom. And we'd run. I'd say, good boy, Shelby, good boy, Shelby. And we'd always be so happy. And he got to saying, good boy, Shelby. And so well, that day in the bathroom, Narvel stepped over to the toilet, was going to use the bathroom. And Shelby walks over to his dad with his blanket in his mouth. He pulls his blanket out of his mouth and says, Good boy, Dad. Good boy. <laughs> I love that story. B.J. Thomas joins Barbara Mandrell. I want to thank you for coming and, and discussing your book, Reba, My Story, and I wish you all the luck in the world with this. Thanks, Ralph. Got a lot of fun. Let's leave it